Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome once again to the Meat and Potato Show, Conservative Talk and Awesome Rob. I, of course, am your host, Christopher Mater. And the candidate interviews roll on here on the Meat and Potatoes 2012 Conservative and Conservative Media Network. Yes, I've only been doing this for so long. Imagine me screwing that one up. <laughs> and appearing on the Meat and Potato Show uh, for his third time. He's running for Congress out of the second Massachusetts district. And I want to welcome to the show my good guest, Dan DeBrule. Thank you so much, Dan, for coming on. So, Dan, we were talking off the mic about the logistics here for uh, the August 30th. You are going to attend. Are you very excited about that? I am. Thank you for the opportunity. And uh, certainly, I'm hoping uh, us grassroots candidates get the word out. Sir, great. Sure. Excellent. Um, uh, speaking about your can campaign, when I first talked to you, the first couple of times, it was very early in your campaign. Um, let's talk about where you are now, what's been going on, your door knocking, you're probably getting out there, getting your name out there. So, go ahead. Well, it's a great question. Basically, uh, when I was here last time, I was seeking the Republican nomination. To right, the yeah, let's, I know things change for you. Go ahead. So, I guess once you get into a subject matter and representing the, the second Russian of District of Massachusetts, such a large district, diverse issues, which really reflect, resonate with the rest of the country is, is dealing with, you pretty much become self-aware of really what's important. Mm -hmm. And I, tell you, I it, it came to the point where I could not be distracted with the, with the, uh, the party politics of, of that special interest group. Right. Um, I, I owe a lot to the Republican Party, Massachusetts Republican Party. They trained uh, me as a candidate several times, offered a lot of, um, a lot of logistics information, things like that. But I just was not able, in a, an open, conscious way, to uh, to carry their flag to represent the people. The people of uh, Massachusetts 2nd Congressional District, uh, yes, you know, a lot of them, 60% of them are conservative and, and definitely find themselves with the uh, GOP type of philosophy, but it, it goes beyond that. And when you want to represent people, you have to go beyond the special interests. It's such a diverse, diverse need, and, and then when you look out of your neighborhood, you see that these problems go on and on all over the country, so it's it's important that you, as a representative, are not up there to push a singular issue. Mm -hmm. This is too much of an important seat, um, the people's seat, to be, to be that, you know, gender-driven, you know. You're here to represent the people and address all the issues. Right, do you find more and more people out there as you're meeting them? Has this been, because I've interviewed other candidates on the show, as you know, and I, and this is, I know it sounds like a war dog question, but it, it's very germane. Um, they're meeting people who are Democrats, independents, even from some of the third parties. They're no, they no longer are looking at that left-right paradigm anymore. They're, they're looking at, no, this is the issue. Everybody knows, and like I've said about the thing that's coming up on the 30th, we all know what the problems are. We all know what the issue. Are you running into that? Is that one of the reasons why you said, wait a minute, maybe I ought to rethink which way I'm going here? Well, my past experience as a retired correction officer, I served in the military. I, I served on private and public nonprofits and things like uh, businesses. And what I found, it, it comes down to people um, boil down to we're Americans. Yeah. The first thing, you know, nobody's nobody on public safety or, or a good Samaritan asks what political group you are, what religion. You know, they're, they're there to help. That's my that's my background. And in politics, I'm, I'm doing the same thing. It's not about what you are or what you believe. It's we're Americans. We have a common common problem, common goal that we need to to focus in on and stop this bickering and infighting. One of the things I'm going to try to do here when, when we do this thing on the 30th is, uh, like I do here on the interviews, and we spoke earlier off the mic, you know, none of that pigeonholing, none of that infighting, and one of the things you had said earlier about certain key issues, I'm not going to mention them, but certain key issues, maybe I should ask them, but that does, and I think you know what I'm talking about, that, that does fall into that, where it becomes this left-right, this bickering back and forth when we've got this much mac bigger macro problem going on, isn't it? Oh, it's, it's, you, it's hard to, to take a grasp of the benefits you, you and the other uh, media groups that are going to be here covering this group does. It gives an opportunity to, for the issues, you know, we're not going to be bickering about the problem, because like you said, we know what they are. Mm -hmm. We're going to be moving forward. 
if we can grab these good ideas that, that bring us together and move us forward, you're going to give us the, the ears and, the, and you're going to bring fresh, freshness to that. Yeah, so. that's, that's, that's been the paradigm. And you saw one of the comments I made, somebody who was having a little conversation with me on Facebook over the, the uh, event page, and, and that's one of the things, ever since 2008, the whole, this entire thing has been designed, you know, if you want that, that gotcha question, you can go to CNN, you know what I'm saying? So, so anyway, uh, let's move on. One of the things that we're going to cover, um, and I had talked to uh, Karen Anderson about uh, the problems with DCF. They're out of control. And you're a former corrections officer, so you you were able to maybe talk to some of the inmates, get into the minutia of their lives, find out what you know. There was always probably domestic problems or something dysfunctional in the family. Now those are people that actually needed DCF help and probably the corrections help and law enforcement help. But we look at Jeremiah Oliver, we look at Justine Pelletier. Um, do you think this is an agency that's gotten out of control? And as a congressman. Now, there's $4,000 that were signed into law by the Clinton administration for every child taken out of a family and put into foster care. Basically, DCF and the foster family, they've, they've got this a lot. And so it, it's becoming like a human trafficking thing. Again, as a law, as a law enforcement uh, corrections officer and somebody who's running for Congress, do you, what problems do you see? Has, has this turned into one of those other alphabet agencies that's just gotten completely out of control? No, that's a great question. And, um and it's a question we're asking because a lot of the public doesn't understand what's happening behind the lines uh, of public service. Uh, there's many reasons for that. Um, being that there's no uh, whistleblower protection, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we know it's a one-party system. You can't sue DCF. If they're found in the wrong, even if courts, everybody says you guys screwed up, the family cannot go back and sue. That's all in the man, that's all in the law. Right, and the reason that can fly is there's supposed be another mechanism for the people to have their Recommend voices heard. Right? There's another way to, for, that's supposed to happen. And what happens is people don't know how to get into that system um, and break it through. There's some very simple steps. DFC, um, the Children's Services is just one of several hundred other agencies and, and parent agencies and mm -hmm. other things that the Commonwealth yeah. has. So it's, a, it's an ongoing problem. I would say a lot of the services, we need to pull the politics out of that. There's a lot of politics being played. We know politics is a dirty game. Yes. Uh, we don't even have to go down that road. We need to pull politics out of that. And we need to let the frontline people that, that put their lives on the line, that want to serve the public and, the, and their families and friends, we have to give them the tools to do their jobs properly and let them know that the public is behind them. So what happens is when you have bad management and bad policies and politics, you know, people, those people that are doing bad things cover themselves and they have the agency's yeah. resources to yeah. back them. And the workers, by law, they cannot go to the, the press, they can't go to the public. I mean, they become it's that- a gag order. It, it is, it's a total gag order. Their livelihoods depend on it. So it's a really tough- And they thing. have families, they gotta make ends meet. It is. And they get fired from a the job, they're screwed, right? And, and when the public's upset, they come at the whole agency. They don't understand there's a difference between the frontline workers and management. Now, a lot of these frontline workers, especially in the public safety arena, you know, child services, health services, the whole, the whole gamut, they take tests. They have standards of employment that they have to, to have. They need to be experts in that field. They need to prove that they're, they're capable of being supervisors. You know what I'm getting at. Mm -hmm. Well, guess who doesn't have to prove who they are? The management. Oh. They come in. Oh, that's right. They're appointed. They're appointed. They come in as this. They go in as that. It's, people don't understand that, you know, if we can make management reapply for their jobs and we use our Commonwealth's resources the right way, things would turn around. Yeah. Like, they don't, they don't let these guys tell you this. You know, it's funny that you said that about, and, and you and I agreed they're appointed. Um, I've been reading a lot about uh, the past presidents um, over the past six or seven months. Right now, I'm going through a biography on Roosevelt and the New Deal. Mm, yeah. And appointments, talk about patronage. Everybody in that day, there's like several chapters. It was almost, I almost wanted to skip the chapters, but I knew I had to just plow through them. Who was appointed to what? Everybody's scratching at the door, 
once Roosevelt was elected, where's my job, where's my job, and that's what he did. And, and we keep seeing that even today, don't we? Like, let's say even like somebody like you gets elected to Congress, you're probably going to have people scratching at you going, hey, remember that favor I did for you? You know? You know? And, and it just, it's something that we can't get away from, can we? Well, you're right. Or how do we get away from? Well, you have to, I would have to say the simplest term you could do is you do it the hive. We do it as the hive. Uh, in the military public safety, you have your, your uh, leadership. Mm -hmm. You might not agree with it, but you have to get behind the, the philosophy. What the high philosophy is, we're in it for the big, the bigger picture, which is America, the American way, and that's and our interest. We fall underneath that, no matter who you are, if you believe in living in society. So if you look at it, that sense is you, you work for the common goals, and you, and you get things done. You, you take away the politics of uh, of a lot of these agencies and other these, these policy-driven, um, you know, the, the, it's taken us into a dark hole. It's a, it's a distraction for what the biggest cause is. Now, do you think this is possibly why, again, same thing with the, the symposium that I'm doing, everybody knows what the problems are, the interviews I'm doing, everybody knows what the problems are. I know I keep sometimes asking the same questions of all the candidates, they are always germane, um, but as, do you think that somehow we're we're just entrenched in this now? There's not really a way out of it, but yet the reason why we keep seeing all these grassroots candidates, and I've been doing these interviews since 2008 when I was on WCW. Every every election season, 2008, 10, 12, 14, I keep doing these, and I keep running into grassroots people, and they all keep saying we've got to hammer away at the politics, hammer away at the politics. And if every every election season, it seems to be getting larger and larger, more and more and more people. Do you think the establishment now is seeing? It's like, well, wait a minute. You know, we used to run on a post, and okay, that Tea Party came up in, back in 2009, and oh, they won some seats. Oh, but don't worry. And then 2012, well, they won some and lost some. Oh, but don't worry. But every year, it's bit by bit, more by more by more by more. Uh, do you think the establishment people out there are starting to see? Because we're all talking the same thing. You guys are too political. You guys are too entrenched. You're just looking out for each other. Uh, and you've seen that as, as you're running through your campaign. Well, my, uh, my we'll say political career pretty much started in 2009, when that's where I had enough. And right. It was a really uh, sparse um, co-patriots out there willing to take on the systems. But what I found was if you give people hope, they're like, you know, maybe I can do something. And next thing you know, there's people, you know, if he's willing to try, I can try. I know I can do better than him. Mm -hmm. that, mi that mindset comes. So the more we come at it, more more times where, where media like yourself, grassroots grow, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're worldwide now. So you're really... I am, yeah. It's one step. It's um, the battle is just showing up. It's taken me since 2008 to get to this point. How many how many patriots did it take to, to turn this country? It took three percent, three percent, and it actually it took them a number of years. It was just it did it took them a number of years. In fact, I was having a conversation a while ago. I think it was with Stephanie Davis when I was co-hosting on her show one day. Um, and what I'd said to her is that, that the history of political movements, it doesn't happen within a year or two years. You, can, you, you find out that political movements start at, well, I'm just going to pick a date. Let's say something starts in 1950 and it, it becomes a flash in the pan. Everyone thinks it's a big thing and it somewhat dies out. But then over time it grows. And then by like 1963 or 65, you find that these people are a formidable force. And it's like, well, where did these guys come from? Well, they've been in the business since 1950, and it's the same. It's the same thing with this grassroots. Everybody thinks, ah, oh, don't worry about those guys. But like I said earlier in our, in our earlier question, it's bit by bit we've been growing, and now here we are in 2014. How this election shakes out, you and I don't know. It's up to the American people. But still, even still, when you shake those numbers out. After November, you're going to look and say, wow, we've got this many people, as opposed to that many people last year and the year before. What are we going to do next time? And what are we going to do the time after that? You're right. And uh, what's happening is that with modern technology, we're going to find find those people that you need. It's, it's, it's a science. Uh, you know, it's politics. You call it what it is. It's a little bit of both. But the, the true or clear message will, will come up to the top. So, yeah. 
not only should we be fighting, you know, against what's taken us down, but we should fight for what will bring us forward. So I'm glad you have that forward thinking. You know, let's find the solutions. Yeah. Let's just not just fight each other. Let's find those solutions. Yeah, you know, the past is prologue, and, and we can't. It, it's it really is. It's past is prologue. And then, like my, my mother was a historian. She she looked at me and she says, "There's nothing you can do about it anyway. It's in the past. It's gone." Forget about it. Just, just move forward. That's all I can learn from it, but move forward. Oh, uh, and speaking about moving forward, let's switch gears. Corrections officer, <clears throat> police officer, you, the militarization of our police. Yeah. Look at Ferguson. I am actually, I've been watching this all over again. I am actually of the belief, as much as I'm against the militarization of our police force, and you've seen my postings, I'm very much against the tyranny, the, the no knock raids, and and the brutality that's going on out there. I'm of the mind, though, that this thing that happened in Ferguson, well, maybe, thank God, they got the riot here and the, and the MRAPs. Maybe, maybe, but then again, I'm focusing, I was like, well, maybe this is what we're supposed to be using that stuff for. Not busting in people's door because they sold a bag of weed or somebody said, oh, I think they have a gun in the house, and at 3 o'clock in the morning, they flashbang in people's house, kill the dog, smash the TV. Oh, sorry, it's the wrong house. Do you see where I'm going yet? Yeah, I want to hear your opinion on that. Well, seeing it from the front lines, I can tell you that um, public safety needs those tools, okay? I don't say they need them on every, every sure. call they have. Right, them. and that's my point. Ferguson, great, great. Pull out the right, you pull it out. I say haul in the tanks too. But if you get a, a warrant, go arrest this guy, he sold a bag of weed. Do we no. really need? No, you don't. I mean, it's common sense. And with the problem, again, I, it comes down to there's a lot of politics behind those policies. Again, really. Now, if you, these guys are front line, you know, most of them, if not all of them, they, they're, they're, they're putting their lives on the line. So they're there for the right reasons. What happens is the policies that are driven by their, their leadership. Again, where they come from, that's, you know, politics plays into that. Which, what we like, we need to do is we need to bring people into that system. They, they have ways. They have uh, citizen commissions. They can be part of that public safety group. They have part of them. Uh, people that are for, for particular victims and, you know, groups like that. So there's, there's ways to, to participate in that. Uh, regular citizens can join auxiliary police units and you know, bring their their flavor. Is into that still that. going? It, it is, is. and if you really? push it every town, I mean, yeah. uh, that's one of the big things that I have for central mass is you know for for public to get involved with their. I forgot about that. You know, it's that? easy to sit back and, and criticize, but there are ways for you to get involved. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to help promote those kind of uh, avenues. Again, those police officers cannot go to the to the to the news agencies and tell them the truth. They can't tell you that they just. Get they were shot at. No right? gag order thing. They were shot at, but they're not able to talk about. You know, there's, there's a lot of things that have gone on that they can't talk about, and and that happens too on the other way around, where you have bad policies and management. That police officer or, or public safety official, they can't stop that because they have a job to do. Mm -hmm. They're fighting against that policy or that issue. You know, maybe we shouldn't be in the streets like this. You know, chief. You know, they're going to be fired. You know, there, there is no recourse for that, so yeah, yeah, that you need to have, it's the politics playing on this. Jeez. Just like they released that video of, you know, of the, of the 18 year old before the shooting. You know, right, well, he was robbing a store or something, right? So, um, it, that, all, that all had to do with poli uh, politics. I know, we see, I know, exactly. We, the original news story was an innocent black man was killed by a white police officer. Uh, and again, I've been on a few other radio shows, and one of the things I always say is that, you know what, when I read the news, I don't believe a single word of it. What I do is I wait. I read it, I wait. Wait a few days, wait for the next story to come out. Wait, wait a few days after that, wait for the next story to come out. And then you take all of them, you digest it, and then I wait some more to see how it all shakes out. At some point in time, what sifts out at the bottom eventually becomes the truth. We do, we find out that, yeah, this, this guy had robbed a store. Um, I'm not sure if he was carrying a gun or anything about, or, or like that, but um, I doubt very much, as much as I, I post on my page a lot of the brutality and, and the things that I, that I don't like to see, um, I doubt very much that a cop just 
pulled out his gun and shot at the kid running away. I doubt that very much. There had to have that you're in law enforcement, you, you know there had to have been something more. Well, it's all with the tools. I mean, if that police officer had a partner, he wouldn't have had to go from zero to 100. That's right. You and know? that's the other thing, right? He's alone, there's a bunch of black kids running right, around, they, right? They, the politics and the policies, they, they uh, undermine our government services. So people people that need the services are hurting because you know, there's, under, you know, there's no money for that. So. Right. We really have to take the politics out of these policies, and you'll see that, you know, American and American way will come, come to the top. Yeah, and the thing is, too, uh, getting to the politics and money, um, interesting statistics, um, that 40%, when you have an agency, and this is top down, it's even through the states, county, when you have an agency and that agency is funded, 40% of that money just goes to operating the agency. Never mind people who are on the streets actually trying to solve the problem that which that agency is supposed to solve. And then you have another 10 to 15% that's lost, wasted, stolen, fraud. So you're right. This is probably why that cop was by himself. Whereas if, he, if the money was going to where it was supposed to go, he'd have a partner with him, somebody who could back him up. And that, that comes closer to home. Never mind, Fergus, we have that issue here yeah, in Central yeah, Mass. Yeah, we have small there. towns. I, right. I've, I've talked to police officers where they're on they're on the major drug carrier routes with really some really yeah. bad people on those roads, and they're by themselves with the limited tools, and backup is is almost close to an hour away. Exactly. Could you imagine being a police officer? What's that, what's that say? You know, you know, when seconds count, the police are only minutes away. It's the same thing for the police. It's like, I'm in the middle of a gunfight here. I'm in the, where's my backup? Oh, they're on their way. Right, and again, but within that next second, boom, that cop is dead. He swore to his life to that cause. Okay, you can, you can brush that aside, but now imagine you're a, you're a, your mother's on that road and she gets in an accident and you only have no resources. So we really need to take a look at the bigger picture of things, get the politics out of these services and out of our general policy decision making and move forward as Americans. Again, let's move on here. Thank you. That was incredible. Thank you for that insight on that. Because I am, you've seen the stuff. And, and I, I'm not anti-police or anti-anything like that. I just, I look at the violence. I look at what is posted out there. I go on to a couple of sites. And I, I see it every day. It's it's the same thing with Islam. It's like people say, oh, well, Islam isn't like that. It's like, well, you know, when I start seeing more and more of helping, serving, protecting, then my attitude will change. If all I see is the same thing over and over again, I, I guess I'm, I'm as guilty as the next American. I'm going to form that attitude of, what the hell are these guys doing? But I, I thank you for saying that. I mean, you gave me a, a different insight, and so now I, but I wanted to move on here, but this just reminded me. When you were in corrections, um, you must have run into situations where you're talking to inmates, and after them being in there six months, a year, and you get to know them, you do. You eventually find out, it's like, well, this guy's in here for a nonviolent crime, or, or this guy's over here for murder and rape. Okay, so you immediately know, all right, we gotta watch these guys, but don't worry so much about these guys. Does that, did you find that as you, as you got to know them? Was that part of your training? Like, can you give us a little insight on that? I guess I could boil it down to, to from my experience in training, is it boils down to uh, mental health issues. I, I, I know, I've seen it, I could almost say I could seen it all and heard it all. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do know a lot of the inmates, I mean, I know, I said, don't. Um, yeah, you didn't know, know everyone personally, you know, but you understand the yeah, question I'm trying to ask. A lot of the, you know, should they be there, should they not be there, that's right. They, there's a lot of good questions that we need to ask. And my philosophy is we need to take a look at some of those those issues, why they're there, why I, a lot of these children are being sent to prisons and, and institutions. And uh, But a lot of it is mental health, you know, and I say mental health, you wrap up, uh, you know, drugs and you, uh, Poverty. Poverty and Jump. other diseases that affect mental health yeah. and decision-making processes. And again, we you take the money out of the resources, so there's only you only have one hammer now. You only have a jail. We don't have mental health institutions. We don't have a lot of programs. So you only have a jail. So you send these people, and you gotta put they're going to mess up, you know, because there's no services to help them. 
they're not going to conform and things are going to happen. And then once you get flushed into that system, the tools, that, you only have so many tools. I mean, I was on the tears with only my, my wits and my radio. You know, it's, you don't have all the resources behind that. So one of the things that I propose and why I run for office is to give a political, a political platform for people to come to me, uh, people from the front lines, that people that are officers now. As a candidate, they can come to me and I can work on these issues. It's kind of like a, a surrogate uh, whistleblower. You know, I find it some almost hard to sleep at night from the stories that I hear that, that keep going on. So we have to fight. Um, and fight in a way that we have to have faith in what we're doing. Because we don't all have the answers and we don't have all the way of doing it. We have to have the faith to go on and believe in the bigger picture, which is America. Excellent. Okay, it is. It's, it, it, when you boil it down to the importance of things, that's what keeps myself going as a grassroots candidate. Meaning, no money, no resources. Yeah, you don't end up being beholden to somebody. That's right. Exactly. And I, I can, I can tell it how it is and see it how it is, and I don't have to pigeonhole it into a certain. So place. what you're saying is, you would open up your, you know, you, if you get into office, you would, you would, uh, your office uh, as not just I'm Dan rule, I represent the second district of Massachusetts. Give me a call. I'm here to. I mean, to talk to me. Come, come to me with your group. Come to me with your with your issues. Let's. Oh, that's a problem. That's a problem I talked about on my campaign. Let's let's form something. Is that what you're? It's almost more than that. Um, I mean, we are a one party state. I mean, we are up against. Yeah. I mean, I fought these type of odds before as a union steward. When they have all the money, all the rules, they can change it at will. I fought against that. And if, you know, all my friends told me, Dan, why are you fighting against them? They have millions of dollars, you have nothing, you have your job on the line. If you keep it clean, you keep it to a wholesome, you know, Got issue, and then, right. you know, the, the bigger issue, what happens is that they, they have to justify their ways. And if after time, that implodes. So what happens is you have to have plans to move forward. So with my campaign, sure, I might not win, but it's a, it's a campaign here. People can come on board. We'll, we're going to file legislation. We'll have the sitting representative file that legislation. So you have to s still participate in That's the right. process. That's right. So as a candidate, we can take it one step further than as a lobbyist or a special interest group. We can make it a, a round table. Whole, you know, it, it's, yeah. it's really, a, it's a, the issues are bigger than ourselves. We're, the, we're Americans, you know. We yeah, you're running to represent, but God forbid something should go wrong in the campaign. You, you, you're not out. No, you're right. And with my campaign, you'll just take what you've learned and form something else and still push. And if you can, if you could see central mass politics how it develops, you can see that you know activists and, and people that, that participate in politics, they kind of get together and they yeah. talk. So my campaign is not about just me getting elected. I, I want. You know the next guy in my in my staff or that's volunteering to learn how to run for office. Yeah. The more people yeah. at it, there, there is no. We're not excluding anybody. It's we're bringing people to the process. Well, I think that's. I think we've seen that in campaigns in the past. Is there's there's a bit of exclusionary, like we're an exclusive club, and um, there's somebody I can think about, but uh, it is. <laughs> I, I don't think that's a winning strategy at no, all. It's, it's posturing. And what it is, is people trying to defend limited resources under a limited and special interest group. You can't actually blame them. No, that's you know, that's, you know, that's, that's what they, what they teach, teach to do, yeah. you know, at all levels. So it's, it's giving people a different opportunity to participate in a situation. I think what you're going to find going forward in the political arena all over the country uh, writing candidates, mm. you know, things like that. Once people start awakening to the issues, I think that's going to be a great way to, to shake up the system. When you have write-ins, you know, it's, um, that'll help bring smarter people to the process. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, a lot of people that, that are intelligent don't want to get involved in politics because it's dirty. Why would I do that? I have to compromise my values. But if they were writing candidates and becoming, getting on the ballots in that fashion, they can stay true to cause mm -hmm. and stay true to the to the overall That's mission. Excellent, excellent. Um, I did want to move on here. Um, the illegal children that are being dumped everywhere. As a potential congressman, how do we solve this problem? I mean, if you were already there, you 
you'd probably be, what would you do? Would you be screaming and yelling well, about I it? Can't, I cannot confirm or deny <laughs> if I have been on a border, but I've seen <laughs> firsthand yeah. this. this yeah, thing. a corrections officer. You've seen a legal I served in the military. And you've served in the military. That's yeah, right. I can't ex expand on that, but I've seen firsthand the policy. And this is over, geez, time flies, well over a decade ago. So this problem has always been with us. Now you have to look at the bigger, bigger picture here. We're, we're, the, we're in the United States of America. We're the goal for anybody in the free world to be part of or immigrant. So we have to be ready for that. So just to close off a wall and try to get a few people through a few mouse holes is not going to work. We have to look at the, the problem and not put immigrants, which this country was founded on, mm -hmm fighting against limited resources against the people that are already here, which is wrong. We have to look at the bigger bigger issues. And once you look at the bigger issues, you'll find that we need all the people that we can get to come on board with the American dream. But what are we dealing with here right now? We're dealing with children. And you and you need to ask, and getting back to my DCF question, and as somebody who worked in, in uh, corrections, it, you know, what type of caliber of parents are these that would send their children unescorted, that kind of thing. And as we all know, the, the people that are crossing over illegally, sure, a percentage of, it, of them want a better life, they want to work, they want to come to America, they want to be Americans. But there is a larger percentage of them, there's gangs, potential I'm, 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 I'm referring to Dennis Michael Lynch's documentary, there's there's definitely, and I, I've interviewed uh, Jackie Costas, who's uh, running uh, for state rep, and she, she herself is a Peruvian immigrant. She remembers the communists down in Peru, and she, she can look you in the eye, and she can tell you, I know that caliber of individual, that they are not here for a better life, they are not here to become Americans. There is that element, and this is the, I guess it's the core question, it's like, how do we address that? I mean, how? When, when you have 10,000 and they're housed there in a, in a warehouse or something, how do, you, how do you sift through that? I would have to say again, we, we have to look at the bigger picture. Now, we as individuals finance ridiculous to me. They're trying to take from what we have, all right? We're, in a sense, we're, we're not looking at the big picture. We have to address that issue further than just at the board. Why are they coming? And, and it breaks my heart to see these kids and, and uh, elderly sit cross over here. Um, you know, I have a Christian faith, and I'll help anybody. It doesn't matter who they are, okay? But I'm not going to steal from, from, from ourselves to help them. Mm -hmm. What you do is you, you adjust that need. Our country is so great, we can absorb those people like it's nothing, okay? We have to just see where we're going with this as a, as a nation, as a country. The American dream, it's, 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 been a, it's been around for a while. We need to look at that mm -hmm. and what, what it really means. I guess what I'm proposing is if people want that American dream, we need to take that and we need to build on that. Um, give them the tools to do that. We do. I mean, Not necessarily um, house them or give them welfare or give them a green, uh, give them a green card, give them a welfare check, an EBT, I but mean, try to give them some sort of impetus go to school, do this, actually become an American. Everything. I wonder if that's something that's been lost in our immigration policy. Because you and I, you know, we're plus or minus the same age. We remember our parents and our grandparents, and we're probably both, my grandparents were immigrants, probably yours too. My parents were. Right, my, my mother too. Um, so, but at the time, my mother would always tell the stories that, you know, her father would say, don't speak the language, you, you speak English, you're an American now. And this is what you need to do, and you've got to go to an American school, and you've got to, and we're going to work hard, because that was the impetus. You, you're in America, you become an American. But now, I think what we see is we see these individual groups clustering in enclaves that are primarily that ethnic group. Do you see what I'm saying? I do. And the reason for being that, that a lot of them, if not for themselves or somebody in their family, I mean, they're trying to stay away from the authority figures, which is immigrations, teachers, things like that. Because once you get into the system, you're, you're acknowledged who you are, you did your place, and if they're illegal, if their family member is illegal, things like that, it's very uncomfortable for them, especially if they're trying to escape from that type of topic, that kind mm -hmm. of environment. So they tend to cluster together, and um, usually it's the religious um, group. So we need to give people the tools. 
I know about out in California, they have American American schools that they have that help people become better, you know, speak English per se. Uh, it's just a different way. We need to provide the tools, mm -hmm. give them an opportunity to become Americans and have that American dream. And for us to sit back and waste our resources to try to deny people the American dream is really self-defeating if you look at the bigger picture. I can agree with that. Well, America's the greatest country in the world. I mean, if you put us side by side by Paris or Britain, those are just doesn't states. Compare. Doesn't compare. Doesn't, yeah, we've, we're bigger than that. We're better than that. We can, we can literally make our own cities in the deserts and put people mentally similar. We have to do something. But just closing ourselves off is not going to work because what happens is we don't have the fortitude to close the borders properly and we'll just die from within. And the money, the money that was supposed to, was to go build the fence and the wall, I mean, that's, like I said, 40% of the money is lost just in the agency itself. Just, I mean, that money is, it gets us back to our original questions of uh, just resources. The cop who has to drive around by himself, I mean, the border agent who has to drive around by himself and cover 10 miles of, I mean, he's by himself and he gets on the radio or getting fired at. Oh, help is on the way. An hour later, he's dead in the desert, you know? It's, it's not about reinventing the wheel. And uh, I know that's kind of like the big picture stuff, but for the district, uh, my knowledge of the system, my knowledge of politics and, mm -hmm. and the government way, is that I know that I can bring a lot to the table. I'm not going up there just for uh, single issues. I have, the, um, I have some good discussion ideas for the healthcare, mm -hmm. public safety, and you know, overall directions for the country. So I'm, you know, I'm driven by bigger, bigger goals than just this seat. You know, I want to give people an opportunity to participate in the system. We can do that. A candidate, we can do that. We can file legislation. We can, we can reach out to media. We can, you know, hold people accountable. You're so. right. The tools are out there. I mean, a guy like me who just does this. I mean, it's it actually, you know, I have to scratch my head. It's like. Why Why do people feel so helpless? It's like, oh, I don't have a voice. I can't go here. It's like there's all sorts of agencies. It's, I mean, just go down to your city hall and ask a question, and you'll be surprised. It's, it's, it is. Direction, oh, go here, and go talk to this person. And then when you're done talking to that person, he'll direct you over here. And, and I know that sometimes it can seem like a labyrinth, but they are. The resources are out there. Again, I know money's tight. Right, and what happens now is there are resources. You just started, you, you started a campaign. How do I do that? You went down to City Hall and asked the question. Exactly. exactly. I, um, a, little bit, a little bit more than that, but what happens is people don't have time for that. They're struggling to survive. Two jobs. you got two seconds to listen to the news, and what do you hear? Bad news. You know, somebody's trying to take what you have. Right, right. You know, so it's really hard to get involved. I mean, to, they, don't, they don't know where to go to start off. There's so many issues to address. And God forbid you do go ask for help to the political system. If you don't align to or ascribe to what they are, you're not going to be helped as well. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where the political play comes in, uh, into play. So if you take politics out of it, as a representative, there won't be any politics. You come into my door as a member, as you'll be my boss if you're a voter. Exactly. Or, or I'm going to be helping you because you're an American or a friend of America. So. Do you see that a lot, though? Because I've run into that. Um, I've run into where I want to try to cover somebody's campaign, and I'm giving the cold shoulder or politely ask to leave the event. Um, I have been down to City Hall looking into trying to find information on things. I've gone to uh, city council meetings to film, and I get the 20 questions. And I think to myself, really, is this how you treat an American citizen? Actually, sorry, sir, I'm your boss. You yes. don't ask me the questions, I ask you the questions. Let's, and let's... it is incumbent upon you to answer them truthfully yeah. and to give me the information and the resources where to go to get more information. None of this cover up, oh, who are you? What do you do? Well, why are you here? That's a great, that's a great, we should put that on a t-shirt. You know, Americans are the boss. <laughs> yes. What happens, for example, let's take, for example, like, you go to a public servant and you say, I'm a taxpayer, I'm your boss. Well, technically that's right, but he's driven, his livelihood is driven by policies mm -hmm. which are dictated by politics, Somebody okay? Now, if you're a taxpayer who has political pull and you go tell that political boss you're not happy with that guy's service, 
You know it's going to change, right? Yeah, then we'll go backwards. Be a, your role oh, let so and so in the door. Oh, so and so from such and such company is here. Oh, step right in. Right. Your road will be paved, as they exactly. say. Okay, but if you if you find yourself not a, as a political yeah. favorite, you're going to get steamrolled. Okay? So we got to change that. You have to change it, and the only change is take the politics out of this. Exactly. Um, when I first met you, you were working uh, supporting Buddy Romer's campaign. Yes. And um, I have one of the people that I've met uh, through my show um, is John DeMake Jr. He's out in California. He's running for president in 2016. I don't know what Buddy's doing. You probably have more information than that. Um, people are. I have a lot of people supporting me that I'm throwing my support behind them. I, I, I don't want to use the word endorse. I'm not, I've still got things coming to do. I've still got the things coming up on the 30th. I've still got to kind of remain a little neutral, but I am listening to this man. I am throwing my weight behind him. Um, but I also have on the other side, people calling me crazy. What, why, why are you, what, what, what's the matter with you? This guy's a nut, this guy's that, the other thing. Did you run into that with Buddy Rowe? Because I did some research. I mean, talk about just an average guy, a normal American citizen, plenty of qualifications to be president, but yet it was the same thing. Yeah, that, that, did you run into that? Well, yes, it, basically I looked at the resumes of, right. of, of the right. other people running at the time. And, and Governor Buddy Romer was, yeah, a, they was, was a governor. He was a representative at yeah. the House. He, Gary he, Johnson, too. He, he, yes, he <laughs> served in both political parties for over 20 years, on each of them, I mean, I saw firsthand as a full-time volunteer and then uh, some after, after that as a paid uh, promoter of the issues that he was trying to, trying to say is that the fact is, it's politics played into it. Yeah. A lot of money in politics. Well, and that's coming thing. back to that same thing. It is. <laughs> that's, you know, I, I've seen it at the national level, almost at the international level, it's politics. Now, if the American and realize that they and realize that they have the power is the way, Americanism is the way to go, politics won't, won't have that full hold that it has now. And this leads me into my next question about uh, when I was talking to you off mic about some of the other grassroots campaigns that I've interviewed here on the show and who are showing up here on the 30th, that um, they all, in their own districts, the established GOP, the established DNC, they've got their golden child that they've already thrown, it's like it's already been decided. Again, I know what you're gonna say, it's the politics. But I mean, it's, uh, I, I, you've seen this even in your campaign, that there's somebody, you don't have to name names, but there's somebody already that they've picked and chosen, and, sure. and how do you, how, well, how are you surmounting that? Are you, how are you doing that? Well, I guess you look at it in the simplest way, it's, it's a special interest group, no matter if it's a political or if it's, you know, I guess, uh, you know, whatever it is, it's a special interest group. Now, within that group, they have a hierarchy in how they get there. You know, you have foot soldiers, I'm better than you on this, yeah, you know, so right. it's kind of a hierarchy of how to get to rise to the top. Just like in, in, in the gangs. You, just, you, you work in the streets and you work your way out. <laughs> it's a special interest group. Right? It's a gang. Break it down any way you want, you know. <laughs> so they work their way up there. Now, now, if the kid on the street out of nowhere has all the money, of course he's going to curry favors and make him sure. run fast. Or he's somebody that's been there from the day one and has worked many years and work up into that position. So I don't want to say that this golden child, it just, you know, people get into that position for whatever reason or whatever way and they, they try to hold off on those resources that that special interest group has. So if you're willing to fight that special interest group you know, membership to get that special interest group's endorsement, you know, good for you. But we're, we're ending up in that vicious cycle. We're eating our own. We're, no, we're yeah. disenfranchising yeah. those who have hope and ideas. Because yeah. we're, we're putting them into a, a grinder and we're trying to force them to be something that they, they're not. Now, if we get, pull the politics out of this and we just look at the real reason what we're trying to do here and what we are, we're Americans, okay? And not everybody in our family and our friends are Americans, so we are bigger than just America. We have allies and we have family and friends that we care about. So we have to start looking at the bigger picture, you know. And I think once we start stop looking down and looking, we start moving. We're going to start moving a lot faster. One of the one of the uh, 
candidates that I had on, and she um, she had written on her website that the incumbent, again, I'm not naming names, but the incumbent doesn't have the right to her seat. She doesn't just like like have it because, oh, I'm this person. She's gonna work for it. She's gonna earn it. This brings me back to what you were just saying about, we, you know, we gotta remove the politics, get back out on the street, fight for that place, prove to the person next door that I'm the person, I'm worth it. I'm worth your time and your donation, your vote, because I've done this and I'm going to do that and keep me in there. That's basically what, get the politics out. Who's this person? Getting me back to what I said about Buddy Romer and John May. Just look at the person, look at their resume, look at, look at, you can, you can look at the record. I, I think what we need to do is we need to look at the accomplishment the person has, what they believe in. You said faith earlier, have faith in what they, what they believe in, have faith in what they, what they want to do to help and change America. We don't, we don't see that with the current crop of mainstream politi uh, politicians and some of the mainstream candidates that are in there. Again, again well, like you said, they, they, even they fought long and hard to get to care. So you really can't blame them. And somehow I've come all the way around into a circle here. But um, I, I, think it's, I think it's interesting that, as, as, again, as we move along further and further and we see more grassroots candidates coming along, they're all challenging. And I think the interesting point that you made about even though these people are established, even they've had to do their work, they've had to, they've had to get there. I think myself, as somebody who's, who keeps seeing these candidates, uh, I mean these politicians who, I mean they're just sitting on their laurels, they really are. It's, it's, you look at what's happening in Congress, they're, they're suspending rules, certain uh, rules of of uh, just voting and the way legislation is going to be put forth in the debating process. Um, they're even making up legislation quite literally off the top of their head sometimes. And everybody's just going along on board. Uh, would you fight to change some of that? I, I do. I, I think what I'm, I'm going to be bringing to the round table, I'd like to say the round table so everybody's involved, is um, we're going to try to push this new revolution to change. I'm not going out there just to just to not only help the second congressional district, which would, I would get, I would want to do, is we're going to give the opportunity for, to change the whole the whole yeah. the atmosphere, the whole resonate policy. Now we resonate and get rid of politics. That that'll go around the country. You know, you get rid of politics, a lot of people will get more involved. Now to make change, you really need bigger goals, and and. Um, and when you look at it, we can't reinvent the wheel. You know, we look at America, where we came from. You know, manifest destiny. We we grow. We're, we're supposed destiny. to be here. There's we're something about this place. I know. We're supposed to be here. People want to be with us. So there's no reason we can't keep growing. Um, and that you know, you, you do things like that, and you it brings a movement forward. I was um, I was part of the uh, uh, of a group that helped bring. Universal healthcare mass shoots in the early years by showing that it can work with private and public uh, agencies. So, if you look at the common goal, we can make it happen no matter where we are. We just need to take the politics out of these policies. So, what's next for you? Where, what's the events? What's, what's going on with the campaign? I guess what I'm trying to do now is I'm, I'm just trying to give people a, a, a platform where they can they can get on to and. and we like getting out there, knocking on doors, and meeting people. Well, I mean, when, when it's yes and no. What I'm what I'm meeting now are, are, are group leaders. I'm I'm searching out uh, people like yourself who uh, mm -hmm. who reach out to others. Sure. Um, the door knocking right now in this political environment are the people in the primaries. You know, they're trying to do the local representation. Right. At the congressional level, you're talking, mil you know, it's, that's a different tier. I a, understand. You know, right. it's, a, it's a larger group. To door knock would take away from others. So what I'm trying to do is prevail myself so people can come to me and we promote those issues from, from that stance. So it's it's a platform that I'm building um, to bring people to the public. What's the website? Well, right now that's part of it. Uh, there is no website. We had stuff, and what happens is it becomes dysfunctional. Um, what we it's tough to get people to manage it. Yeah, it is. Right now, I guess what my platform. Um, with the amount of technology, there's like 15 different uh, media technologies what we're looking at. What I'm asking people is to, just to reach out to me, Google Dan Dubrule, D-U-B-R-U-L-E, you'll see all the avenues to reach out to me. 
do it. You know, we're not, I'm not going anywhere. We're going into a primary season. Um, I'm pushing uh, my political thoughts in that. That'll convert into a general election that and Set. continue into the next election. Set. Set. So it's ongoing. And of course, when the video comes out, I'll, I'll, I'll put your, at least your Facebook site, maybe sure. your email or something on there, and just so people can get hold of you. Yeah, so. I will appreciate it. Certainly. No, that, that's great. Dan, thank you so much thank for you, coming sir. on to the show. Uh, thank you it's for always, watching. It's, it's, yeah, it's always great having you guys on. Third time, third time guest on the Meat and Potato Show. Thanks, thank you, Dan. Thank you, sir.